Good afternoon. Thank you for connecting with the Pennsylvania Game Commission today. My name is Brittany Howell and my colleague Lori and I will be managing this session. We're fortunate to be joined today by Tammy Colt, the Regional Wildlife Diversity Biologist for the Pennsylvania Game Commission. She'll be talking to us about backyard habitat. Before we get too far into this, we'd like to just do a quick audio check. So if you could please um, just type into the chat box and let us know if you can hear us. We expect this presentation to last about 20 minutes, followed by a question and answer period of about 10 minutes. You can ask a question by typing into the type question here box on the GoToWebinar control panel at the right of your screen. For those of you dialing in to listen by phone, please note that this is not a toll-free call and you may receive long distance charges from your service provider. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Tammy. Would you like to share a little bit about your background information or background before you get started? Sure, thank you, Brittany. Um, as a regional wildlife diversity biologist, and there is one of me in every region of the Game Commission, so there's six of us, and I'm in the Southwest, um, what we do is manage the species of greatest conservation need. So those are all those species listed in the state's wildlife action plan that we know are in trouble or uh, their habitat is disappearing, um, things of that nature. So there were over 100 birds and mammals alone that are listed as species of greatest conservation need. So we're managing them on, uh, it, you know, within our regions. And we do that mainly through helping private landowners better manage their wildlife or better manage their habitat. Um, my background is uh, a bachelor's in animal bioscience from Penn State University and a master's in biology from Indiana U University of Pennsylvania. I want to thank everyone who's spending their lunch break listening to this, and thank you for your interest in wildlife. I thought what I would do, since we have such a short amount of time to cover a very broad topic, uh, is that I would cover the fundamentals of habitat management, so in a similar way that I would look at a much bigger property to plan, like I normally do in my day-to-day -day job for the, the Game Commission. Um, we'll go over those fundamentals, and then I'll provide some simple and inexpensive options that will benefit wildlife in your backyard, um, kind of gearing it to those of us uh, like me who don't have the time or the money to create the birds and blooms or better homes and gardens cover in our yard. So first of all, the basics. I'm sure somewhere in a science class in junior high or high school or something, you covered that question of what do animals need to survive? And the standard answer is food, water, water, shelter, and space. So we will cover those today, but um, we won't really talk about space. Wildlife biologists can go on and on about home ranges and territories and things like that. But in this particular case, we're dealing with just the space of your backyard. And um, that kind of limits us as far as home ranges and things like that. So we won't talk about space. We also won't talk about water, and I'll explain why in a minute. So what we're really going to talk about, as all of us habitat managers tend to talk about, is food and cover. Cover is the same as shelter for us, so uh, the, the standard is to say food and cover. So why aren't we talking about water? Because water is not a limiting factor in Pennsylvania. The blue lines here uh, re represent a map of all of the streams in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania actually has more miles of stream than any other state in the lower 48. So uh, it's not a limiting factor. Our wildlife usually don't need water. Now, certainly the quality of aquatic habitats is very important, especially to many of these species of greatest conservation need. But we're managing those on a much larger scale than we can talk about for your backyard. So while there's certainly um, water features that you can put in for aesthetics and you might increase some of your wildlife viewing opportunities and fun by providing things like bird baths. I won't go into water features today. Um, the first thing that I do when planning a property, a, a management plan for a property, is to use mapping software to look at that property and the landscape around it. And I would encourage you to do the same. So you can go to uh, Google Earth or Google Maps or any similar platform and type in your address, zoom into your property, and then zoom out and look at the landscape around you. If your landscape looks like this, heavily residential and managed, backed up to a lot of forest that's probably 
primarily deciduous forest. Um, and this is the case for a lot of our residential areas in Pennsylvania, um, especially here where I work around the Pen uh, Pittsburgh area, and we tend to have this quite a bit. Um, the wildlife that you will attract will be very different than, say, a landscape like this, where someone has a house that's surrounded by acres and acres of farmland, like mine. So you want to look at that to think about potentially what wildlife can you attract, and also what's missing on that landscape that you can provide. Now, before we get into food and cover, I want to talk about changing some of your relationships. What do I mean? Well, you see this guy? You and this guy have been spending way too much time together. This is that guy in high school that your parents said they didn't want you to hang around with because he was a bad influence. That's your riding mower. Um, if you could spend less time mowing, mowing less acreage, mowing less frequently, you will benefit wildlife. Likewise, fall out of love with ryegrass. Monocultures of ryegrass or similar grasses provide absolutely nothing for wildlife. They're kind of like that relationship that folks have where they really fell for someone because they're so good looking, but then after a while realize they're getting nothing back from it. That's ryegrass. The other issue with ryegrass is it's very chemically dependent. Without a lot of uh, herbicides and fertilizers and pesticides, you're not going to maintain it as green not to mention the great amount of water that you have to apply to it to keep it green like that. So is it worth it to do all that mowing? I won't read all these facts to you, but I'll, I'll give you a second to look over them and just remember that you can use less water, reduce or eliminate pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers, and waste less energy by doing less mowing. Let me introduce you to your new friends, clover and dandelions. Um, these, both of these pictures are actually of my yard, um, so obviously I've, I've fallen out of love with ryegrass long ago. Uh, the dandelions are one of the earliest bloomers, and so they're very, very important to pollinators. Uh, the clover, once it starts blooming, will bloom all summer long. Neither of these need to be watered. All you have to do is mow, mow them once a week or so to maintain them, and um, both very important to pollinators. They bloom consistently, um, they bloom, bloom frequently and repeatedly, and uh, the other thing is your birds that are looking for bugs to feed their young are going to come out on this to, to look for that. Clover is an important bugging type of uh, forage um, or, or cover type. And then forage, uh, these are both preferred forages for things like rabbits. So your herbivores will enjoy the dandelions and clover also. One caveat to both of these is that they're not native. They are what we call naturalized, so we don't classify them as invasives, but um, they did not originate in North America. So that is one drawback to both of these species, but they are so prevalent and so easy to maintain and so good for the birds and pollinators coming to your, your yard. They're worth having. So in general, though, we want you to go native. Why? Because native plants support the native insects and therefore the ecosystem. That relationship between the pollinators and the angiosperm plants is what makes our ecosystem go round. So those components have to be there if you're going to have the other wildlife that you're hoping to, to attract. Um, many of the birds that you want to attract to your yard are insectivores, especially during the nesting season when they need to feed the, that protein source to their young. Um, you will want to try to control the invasive plants, so familiar, familiarize yourself with those. Um, I'm not going into those in detail. We could spend an entire webinar or, or more just on the invasive plants that could show up in your yard. Another caution is to beware of cultivars. So sometimes there are native shrub species that have been developed as a landscape variety, and so those blooms may not be as beneficial to the pollinators, and they may not fruit. They may, may be bred to not produce fruit because that fruit will become messy in your yard. So in a strict landscaping situation, that's unwanted, but that's not what you want. You want it to be the native thing that's going to give you those blooms and those fruits. Okay, so let's talk about cover first. Uh, the important thing with cover is you want to be diverse. 
the more different types of cover you can provide in your space, the more diversity of wildlife you'll attract. So you want to make sure you have both woody and herbaceous vegetation. You want that vegetation to be of different heights. So you want the trees and then the shrubs and then vegetation that's tall, vegetation that's short. Um, and then you may want to provide other features like rock piles, brush piles, and don't forget cavities. So um, one thing about managing for wildlife in your yard is it's often kind of messy. It's messier than, you know, the, the neatest, most perfectly landscaped yard. This is my yard, I'm not ashamed to admit. It's kind of messy. I don't mind that. Um, but you can see that I've got the trees there along the edges and then uh, a shrub border and the uh, taller herbaceous stuff there. Yes, I do have some invasives, always working to control those. And then the mowed yard with the uh, clover and dandelions in it. Those uh, other features that I talked about, um, like brush piles, uh, rock piles, or rock gardens, um, those can be really beneficial to amphibians and reptiles. Now, maybe you personally don't want to attract a lot of reptiles to your yard, uh, but some of us like that, so um, rock piles can be great for that. Um, on the right side of the screen, there's the conifer planting. Conifers are really important to, for uh, winter thermal cover. So I'm sure if you have a conifer and if you put out a bird feeder, you know how the birds in the winter like to uh, hang out in those conifers for, for protection. So that's always a nice feature, especially if you don't see it when you look um, on that Google Earth or whatever and look on the landscape. If you're not seeing clumps of conifers, you might want to provide that. On the left side of the screen, and that's also my yard, um, there's a warm season grass planting. So you may th be familiar with um, the pampas grass or African grass that people use in landscaping. Those, of course, aren't native. But we have beautiful, tall native vegetation or native grasses in the form of switchgrass and big blue stem, and there's, there's many others. There's switchgrass and big blue in that uh, clump that you're looking at in my yard. I used it to cover up a spot that was just hard to mow, so it was easier to have this tall stuff. And then I just let the um, naturalized and native things also join in, so there's a lot of goldenrod and things like that. So the, the beauty of that type of cover is that it's um, a great hiding place, and it will stay standing, especially those warm season grasses will remain standing all winter long. They won't be matted down by snow, so it's a good place for the birds and rabbits to hide. And also, don't forget cavities. So uh, if you're in a residential area, it's very typical for any diseased or rotting trees to be removed immediately because, of course, they can be a hazard. So that means that the cavities are lacking on your landscape. So we know that birds like um, bluebirds and certainly the owls, uh, the, uh, uh, wow, <laughs> the little hawk, his name just, jumped out of my head. Kestrel. A kestrel, thank you. <laughs> like, I, you know, I've been reading emails about peregrines all morning trying to schedule the peregrine bandings. And uh, so that I'm like looking at it going, that's not a peregrine. What is the thing's name? Kestrel. <laughs> um, those use cavities. So you can put up uh, nest boxes, which are available from the Game Commission. Or another trick, um, and this is from biologist Samara Trousseau's yard, was uh, there was a tree that was dying, and rather than cut the whole tree, they just cut the top off so that it wouldn't fall on their house and just left that stump, that tall stump, or what we would call a snag, a standing dead tree, um, left it there, and the woodpeckers moved in and made holes, and now they've got little cavity nesters using it. So that's kind of a more creative way to get those cavities in your yard. Um, moving on to food, you want to provide lots of flowers for the pollinators. Again, you can tell pollinators are a favorite of mine, but remember those insects are an important food source for the other wildlife that you want to attract. Uh, as far as berries and things, that you want to have the soft mast, and then you also, if you can, you want to provide hard mast, which is a really important winter food source for our Pennsylvania wildlife. So if you have room in your yard for a nice big oak, that's ideal. If you don't have that, you can plant something smaller like um, an American hazelnut. And then, again, you want to have a great variety. The more variety of blooms and fruits you have, the more different species you attract. And also, you want to try to provide that food over several months of the year. Now, I do caution you. We do not mean put out a smorgasbord. 
supplemental feeding can be an issue and you will invite a lot of party crashers to your yard if you're putting out piles of corn or piles of apples and sweet feed and things like that. So um, that's generally not a good idea. You can create a nuisance problem for yourself. You can also create safety issues. Remember that things like raccoons are carrying diseases like rabies that you and your pets can get. Um, you could also, if you're causing wildlife to congregate, uh, create a potential law enforcement problem because that could impact public safety. And um, the other thing is it's not great for the wildlife themselves because they then spread diseases and parasites uh, amongst each other when they're congregating over a food source. Forgot I had one other guy in there. You, do, you really don't want to have that guy coming to your yard as a habit. So avoid that supplemental feeding. Okay, as far as the flowers, we want to try to provide flowers, things that bloom early, things that bloom in the middle of the summer, and things that will be blooming late so that we're providing food across as many months as possible. So you want to have some of the trees like uh, service berry and red buds that bloom super early, and then um, some of the shrubs and things, crab apples, viburnums, blueberries. So you're getting into the almost to midsummer there with blooms, and then um, the perennial flowers will be midsummer to late. So things like the ironweed here will be blooming quite late, and um, will be a very important food source to the pollinators other thing you'll want to do is provide a lot of different colors and different flower shapes because different pollinators have specific needs or, or they're drawn to certain colors. So um, I, I do have a, a seed list that shows in the different times of the season this color wheel that you see with uh, the, what colors will be in that mix. Um, and that was, I credit biologist Matt Sarver, Sarver for coming up with that and sharing that with me. Um, so that's just a, a sample from that seed list. Likewise, you want to provide fruits across the season. So the two things go hand in hand. If you're planting things that are going to be flowering across different months, then you're going to have fruits across different months. So you'll have things like, say, the mulberry tree here that fruits very early and then um, you would also have in midsummer maybe blackberries or blueberries and then um, by late summer you would have oh, some of the native shrubs and some of the like crab apples and things will have their fruits then and then some things some of the crab apples will hold their fruits very late into winter um, the Hercules Club pictured here will hold its fruit very late and uh, black hall black hall viburnum is another one that does that too uh, one thing to note when it comes to planting the perennial wildflowers, I have experimented with both uh, seed packets and also buying the, the actual plants. I have much more luck with the plants, very little luck with uh, seed packets, and um, in, it, anecdotally, a lot of other gardeners tell me the same thing. Um, so I think if you're probably better off to go with buying plants, even though that's a little more money output at the start. But if you're looking for the best bang for your buck, I can't say enough about sunflowers. Um, very cheap, easy to grow. They're very showy. They come in different colors, different heights. Uh, pollinators absolutely love them, as you can see from the, the photo there. The seed eaters will love them. The birds will be all over them. And I've had really good luck with them reseeding. So, um, that's a lot to pack in to a short time, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. And let me just keep this last screen up while we do questions so that uh, you can see the references there. Um, just briefly, the Game Commission's website has lots of information on there for wildlife. Um, and uh, what else? Uh, you can find nest box plans if you'd like to build your own boxes. There's information on landowner programs there. And you can also go to um, the uh, buy merchandise or something over on the right um, where you can order nest boxes that are made in our Howard Nursery. Also, uh, sometimes there are seedlings available from Howard Nursery. There is a book on managing wildlife available in the, or I'm sorry, managing backyard wildlife in the outdoor shop. You can order that. Uh, 
I also want to point out that the National Wildlife Federation has a backyard wildlife habitat certification program. Um, and a lot of people find that really beneficial in helping them to plan out their backyard wildlife. And then uh, they're happy to get certified and be able to put a sign out there. Um, and then the, the Phipps Conservatory in Pittsburgh now has a Center for Sustainable Landscapes and offers a lot on native plantings. Um, so there's information there. And then I've also put a top our email there if you have questions that we don't get to at the end of the webinar. Thanks so much, Tammy. Um, we do have some questions coming in. Uh, for those of you who haven't asked a question yet, you can just type it in the box on the side and we'll try to get to those. Um, so one of the questions was, is there a website that you like to use that lists descriptions of invasive plants so that people can recognize which ones are invasive in their yard? Um, wow. <laughs> there are a lot of those. Uh, the one that I most frequently go to now, because it's very Pennsylvania specific, is um, Penn State's Cooperative Extension has a lot of information on the different invasives, and um, they also have information on controlling those invasives and give you, gives you the options for mechanical, biological, chemical control, and things like that. But they, they'll help you with the ID and all of that. So Penn State Extension is a good go-to for invasive, invasive species stuff. Okay, great. Um, somebody else had asked, is there a distance that those cover areas should be away from dwellings? Um, no, not really. Not really. Uh, I, the only issue is um, things like switchgrass, so like that planting I had that's kind of in the middle of my yard that has the, the native grasses, uh, that the, the dead grass or the thatch um, is very flammable. In fact, we manage those in, in our bigger habitat situations by burning. Um, so you may not want that right up against your house uh, because, you know, then if there would be a wildfire or someone flicks a cigarette outside your house or something, you know, that's right up against your house. So I would maybe not put those right up against the house. Okay. But otherwise, yeah, I think they had asked if there was anything with um like foundation problems, if anything was too close, growing too close to the house or something like that. But uh, right, um, I don't ever have an issue with the shrubs being fairly close to the house. Just like you know, most folks have landscaping that shrubs, shrubbery right around the house. I wouldn't put trees very really close to the house. So, mm -hmm. um, what about salt or other minerals like that on a home property? Yeah, that falls right under um, supplemental feeding and will cause all those same issues that we talked about. So I would avoid that, and it's really not um, a limiting factor for wildlife. And really, the only thing that really, really comes to that for the salt is the deer, and you really don't want to attract those to your yard. Mm -hmm. Uh, you had mentioned about the dandelion and clover, actually great for the pollinators and so forth, um, but somebody had said a lot of um, homeowners associations don't really appreciate that. So they said, is there anything else that they could have like in their grass area that would um, maybe not be as hard on the eyes or is um, not <laughs> that the homeowners association might be more pleased with, I guess? Right. Um, wow. I guess it depends on the specifics of the homeowners association, and that is a uh a challenge for backyard wildlife habitat. A lot of the homeowners associations don't allow taller grass, um, and so you can't have those cover areas. So that's certainly something to work on with, with your homeowners association. But as far as having something that you could get away with in the mode area, um, I, I would think you could still get the clover in there because it's it's not like the dandelions, and it doesn't doesn't have an ugly stage like dandelions do. Um, so clovers or uh, trefoil, bird's foot trefoil, um, those two things would probably be fine. Unless okay. they have a strict rule that it has to be all grass. Okay, yeah, I'm not sure about the specifics of it. Um, we had a couple people asking about hummingbirds. Number one, how is how should people attract hummingbirds, I think, in a more natural way, perhaps, than just a feeder? And also, um, somebody else was saying that they've heard other people have seen hummingbirds in the area, but they haven't seen any in their area yet. Is that, it's uh, May 4th today, so is that common that some people might not be seeing them yet? 
Um, yes, and I actually I haven't seen them at my house yet, and it usually is the first week of May when they appear. Um, it's hard to say what will happen this this spring. I mean, it almost it felt like summer yesterday, but it snowed at my house on Sunday. So oh, wow. uh, we had we had a very late, very cold spring, and I don't know how that will affect them moving north. So, uh, but I wouldn't panic yet because I know sometimes it's been past May 10th when I first saw my first hummingbirds of the year. So don't panic. If folks are seeing them, I'm sure they're on their way. Um, as far as natural things to put out for them, um, wow, I'm not an expert in that, but uh, I know that pretty much anything that has a trumpet shape and that they really like reds, um, like mm-hmm. the deeper colors they're, they're attracted to. So a lot of the hanging baskets tend to have things that will attract them. What I notice with my hummingbirds, though, is they'll be attracted to the hanging basket, but they don't seem to feed there very long. They seem to prefer the hummingbird feeder. So, um, you know, I do put out a hummingbird feeder. I'm lucky that I, bears never come close to my house. I guess it's just the setting for me, but, um, I, you know, I don't have bear issues, so I, I can put that sugary stuff out all summer. So, uh, but, you know, there, but there are flowers, and certainly there's tons of information online on on that do you have favorite native plants or favorite nurseries that you like to go to to get those native plants or trees um so as far as favorite native plants um crab apples certainly as far as in the in the tree world in the flower world i uh have a lot of luck with cone flowers and probably the most important family of uh, perennials that we can add to our landscape is milkweed. Um, we all know that monarchs are really in trouble now, um, pollinators as a whole, so milkweeds are a fabulous one to put in. Um, and one of my favorites there is the butterfly weed, the one that's bright orange. Mm-hmm. So as far as um, native plant nurseries and such, uh, I know that um, Octorero Nursery is a good source that a lot of the contractors who do some of my plantings go to. Um, and in Pennsylvania, Ernst Conservation Seeds has been a great partner um, in providing native uh, seed mixes and lots of advice on how to get those things established. So those, those are two that I know of that I, I know have been a source for some of my habitat plantings. Can you talk a little bit about the Private Landowners Assistance Program that you help with? Yes. Um, So that's different than a backyard wildlife uh, program. We do require you to have at least 10 acres to be eligible for Private Landowner Assistance Program. Through that, we provide a totally free habitat management plan, and um, we take into account what the landowner's objectives are. So if that landowner is also farming or managing for timber or managing for specifically for deer hunting or whatever it is, we will incorporate incorporate that into the plan. Um, We start out by having you fill out an application that gives us a lot of info. It helps us to do some recon before coming out, especially using that mapping software. And then we uh, schedule a visit and walk the property with the landowner and talk about their objectives. Um, look at that habitat and assess it, and then give you a plan with recommendations and explanations of what you can do. Um, There's no contract, so what you choose to implement in the plan is up to the landowner. Uh, But if we have funding sources or know of funding sources, we try to link that landowner with those appropriate funding sources to help accomplish what's in the plan. And that is a free program, correct? That's free, yes. All right. Yeah, there was a gentleman um, by the name of John who was asking about um, a larger property that he has. And so, John, if you would like to email us to learn more about that, that that email address is on the screen there, pgccomments at pa.gov. Or if you go onto our website, um, I believe it's under Get Involved, you can also look at the Private Landowners Assistance Program for more information. 
So I think we're about to wrap it up here. One of our other biologists is also um, participating in the webinar, and she just mentioned that we should remind all of you that um, there is a great section in the State Wildlife Action Plan called Take Action, Get Involved um, that describes um, some ways that you can help wildlife on your property. So um, you can find that information on the PA, pgc.pa.gov website as well. So thank you all for participating with us today. And thank you, Tammy, for um, putting that presentation together and showing us all a little bit about how we can improve our um, our backyards and maybe not have that uh, bad boyfriend mower and grass that you talked about in the beginning, um, but um, have some stuff that's more beneficial for wildlife. Um, so we're sorry if there was anybody that we weren't able to answer your question today. Um, but again, if you look at that, email address on the screen. You can send questions that way and we'll be happy to try to answer them afterwards. This ha webinar has been recorded and it will be uploaded to the Game Commission's YouTube channel uh, at a later date where captions will be auto-loaded. I'd like to thank Tammy for sharing her expertise and time with us and thank all of you again for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us this afternoon. We hope you'll join us again to learn more about Pennsylvania's wildlife in upcoming webinars. Send us an email if you have a suggestion for a webinar topic. Until then, we hope you're able to get outside and enjoy some of Pennsylvania's great outdoors.